not for the entire time. And uh, the, uh, the lecture, uh, the last lecture of the day, will be given by Christian Tomasetti from the Center for Cancer Prevention and Early Detection of City of Hope. And the title of the talk is Mathematical Modeling of Cancer Evolution. Stage of Europe. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, all right. So, let's um, today we'll talk about this, but let's go back because we didn't finish. So, yesterday. So, uh, just as a recap, remember we talked about uh, NMF and how NMF is used um, in. What it, I would say today is considered the gold standard for, you know, cancer etiology, which is this methodology called mutational signatures. All right, and we saw. So I just one reminder in in NMF, right? Since you you take the original matrix and you are going to factorize it with two matrices, they are still non-negative, whose product is as close as possible, depending on the metric that you pick to the original matrix, right? That's the whole idea. Um, but, but one issue is that, um, so say if original matrix has dimensions n times m, right? When you look at the two, the w and h matrix, um, feature and coefficient matrix is one way to, to call them. Now you have the issue that you have to decide a dimension, yes? Uh, which is, you know, whatever, the, the P dimension, right? So, and the question is what that dimension is going to be is going to significantly affect the results that you're going to get, right? And, and just to be clear on, uh, and maybe I, sh I could have had a second slide on this, but if you remember, um, I was saying that in the original matrix, I want to give you, because I feel maybe yesterday. Okay, so, in, in the original matrix, sorry, here, right? What is an entry? So here, every row say it's a patient, okay? And then every column is one of those 96 mutation types that we discussed, right? So the point mutation, one single nucleotide change, plus the two flanking bases. So we have 96 triplets. And so here you have counts of those triplets for one patient and then across patients. So each row is one patient. So now you split it into matrices where, where on one side you have the signatures, okay? So again, and, and on the other side you have intensities for those signatures, okay? So as I was saying, uh, and I think this picture, um, it's, it's okay in showing that, you, if you remember, the mutation assignators are, are probability distributions uh, on these triplets. Uh, here, for simplicity, I just shown the six major types, but then there are subtypes, right? So <clears throat> these are just probability distributions. So one matrix just has that as columns. In fact, in the, in the signature matrix, the columns add, add up to one because it's a probability distribution, right? And as I said, the best way to think about it is, say, for example, in the presence of smoking or any carcinogen, really, is, okay, now because of smoking, a cell is going to have a mutation on, on its DNA that was not present before. What type of mutation among the 96 possibility is going to be? It's like, you know, rolling a die, flipping a coin. It's according to this probability distribution, which is the signature matrix, okay? So columns add into one. And then the other matrix in the factorization is the intensities of each one of the signatures. So in each patient, um, right? In each patient, sorry, I keep going back and forth. So do you see both the, the mathematical representation and, and this uh, more maybe intuitive one? Uh, <clears throat> it, it tells you how strong uh, each one of those senator is in an individual patient. Okay. So, but the fundamental problem, as I was saying, is that you have to choose this third dimension, right? Because when you have a factor of two matrices, 
the dimensions are three, right? Each one of them has two and one has to coincide, so there are three. And that one has to be picked by either you or using some algorithm, right? To um, optimize the choice. And what I was discussing yesterday is that um, it looks to me, and this was the origin of, of this paper. And by the way, let me say, I know I said it yesterday, but I'm, you know, I've been in, in schools like this one. And one thing I really hope that you get from this is just an example of how, uh, how to think about, you know, what is that I can do with respect to what is out there, right? So here, for example, you look at this type of work and you say, okay, this is interesting. I know about NMF or I study and I'll, I'll review what NMF is. And then you say, okay, what, what are the potential pitfalls of this technique, which is the gold standard in this field, okay? Where is potentially the problem? And one of the problems, as I said, is because you have to choose this dimension, then you end up, if you don't have the right number of, you know, if it's not the correct number of signatures, uh, it's just a mathematical technique. You know, there is no magic in it. This thing just takes a matrix and you have to make two matrices out of it whose product gets very close to the original one, right? But it's no magic. So if you pick 20 dimensions and there are four, it's going to be a very messy result where the truth is spread out across many, many more signatures than what, it, what it's real. So here, <clears throat> in my opinion, it's pretty clear, right? More than my opinion. I think everyone would agree that it's certainly not the case that every patient living cancer is a smoker or that, or that uh, you know, um, every breast cancer uh, patient has BRCA mutations in them. Um, but again, this technique is forced to split things. And, and in my opinion, one, uh, uh, you know, one obvious, limit is beside the dimensionality is that in a sense <clears throat> with NMF, NMF is going to distribute a little bit of each signature to everyone. Is, is that, does it make sense intuitively, right? And so that's exactly what you find. Now you can think, well, okay, you know, you're making a big deal out of this, but the reality is that I can pick a threshold and I can say, when I see things that are very little present in a patient, I say, that's just noise, there's just an MF that cannot be perfect, right? But the reality is that, and that's exactly why I'm showing you, uh, you know, these two examples, because in fact, this is true across all cancer types, is that BRCA, which is the orange signature here, the sign here, this, the, the signal here is huge, okay? But there are actually very few women that really have the BRCA mutation. okay? So it's not that you can say, I'll set up, like I said, something that if it's 5% or below, I'll just put it down to see, force it to be zero. Okay. Yes. Question: uh, Do we have these uh, signatures and use this matrix, uh, matrix uh, factorization to find out the esters, uh, uh, strengths of the signature, or we do this uh, mat uh, matrix factorization and interpret the uh, rows as the signature? Uh, so. Uh, they do both of those things, okay? So on one side, um, so this, this is a, a, a very good question. So on one side, okay, so this is just data, right? This is genomic data. I get, I don't know, 10,000 patients. And for each one of them, I write down the counts of each mutation type, how many they have. And then I come up with, and then I get these two matrices, right? So on one side, I can look at the signatures and then I can ask, you know, how are the signatures? So biologists are very interested in looking at this matrix and say, what is this particular signature right here, right? Uh, cancer researchers are interested in that, but also interested in the intensity of each signature in a given patient, right? Because that, is going to talk about the etiology of a given cancer, of a, you know, of a given patient, right? Uh, for example, if in a patient I see a, a lot of smoking, right? I say, okay, it looks like smoking is what caused your cancer, for example, right? So you can, both of those aspects are. Um, 
And of course, one of the problems is that because this is unsupervised, um, when you come up with the list of senators, you don't know which one is mocking, which one is sun exposure, which one is age, right? What you can do is a posteriori say, well, this particular senator, so for example, senator, what they call senator one, it's present, you know, especially even more in older people. So this is aging probably, right? Or this senator seems to be present in smokers. But so that, that was the whole, the whole point of, of what we thought to do. Uh, and yesterday I talked, so I won't repeat that. You know, we saw that in effect, um, uh, much of the senators are just noise, are, are not really very helpful. Even for the few ones that we know what they are, okay, you can look at the peak and that has some meaning, but the rest is just noise. Um, so I won't repeat that part. But so what we thought to do is, uh, well, first of all, um, if we know of an exposure, why not train whatever algorithm you want? Why not train the algorithm, teaching the algorithm that that patient that was exposed to smoking or alcohol or whatever that is, right? So a supervised approach, supervised learning should always beat an unsupervised one in terms of performance, if done properly. So that, that was the whole idea. And, and the other was, as I, and I think that was the last thing I mentioned yesterday, was <clears throat> that in, in, the, in the previous one, uh, you have to assume that, or they assumed um, that each mutational process um, was the same across all cancer types, right? You get one senator, senator five, and that senator, if you, if you create Maybe I, I, I didn't say that well. Let me, let me just say this today better, which is when you come up with this matrix made out of senators, okay? Obviously, the more data you have, the more probably the better job you are doing. Uh, so what typically is done is people take cancer data from like say 30 different cancer types, okay? Put them all together and then say to NMF, Give me mutational symmetries, please. Uh, the problem is that you are mixing different cancer types, okay? And so the assumption they are making is that mutational signature one is going to be a given pattern, no matter which, which tissue you're looking at, okay? And one question I had was, you know, well, that doesn't have necessarily have to be true, right? Because I can imagine that say smoking has an effective increase in lung cancer and maybe pancreas, actually it does also pancreatic cancer, but the presence of the smoke in the lung, I would expect it to have a, a very different effect in terms of carcinogenicity than the effect, much more indirect effect in pancreas, right? And in fact, in the lungs, it's like the risk goes up by 20 fold or more in pancreas, you know, a smoker will risk twice as much as a regular person and a non-smoker. So, so that's why we thought, okay. Um, oh, and, and, and also remember uh, talking about uh, talking about the random. So if you remember here, what we did is we said, well, let's just create random senators. Pick one that has the peak as C2T, which is the aging senator. And uh, let's see how it performs in predicting old versus young people, okay? And we show that beside the peak, which was already known to be due to the aging, C2T mutation, there was not much else. Um, but the thing is, we know that uh, we, are, we know these peaks for a few uh, carcinogens, but if you are trying to do discovery, right? Um, basically, you have a, a, a long list of signatures with some peaks. By the way, not always peaks, because if you remember the plot I showed you, look at the signatures, right? So sometimes there are peaks, like signature one. But one of the most important, by the way, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's an R signature as much as one. 
which is five. And I think even the authors agree today that five has an important role in aging too. Look how, you know, pretty flat. It's pretty uniformly distributed across the board, right? So, so it's a little bit difficult to interpret in my opinion, right? To, to know exactly what to do with this. It looks cool, but how useful really is. And sometimes, as you know, methodologies become trendy, like, you know, like anything else. There are trends and fashions in science too, right? So everyone is doing it because, well, because everyone is doing it, right? And then uh, you pretend not to see the problems with that and you go, and then at some point, hopefully someone improves it. So, okay, anyway. Uh, these are, these are some of the concerns that motivated the study. And uh, so we thought, okay, let's do, um, well, here is what I thought. Uh, what is that we are interested in? We want to do, we want to understand signatures for cancer etiology, and we want to be able to predict, okay? In a patient where say, we don't know of the exposure, how strong was the exposure? I think that it's important in, for practical purposes. So let's use you know, the metrics. So let's look at prediction, for example, AUC, that's what we use, and, and see how, and use that as a metric <clears throat> to develop a methodology that's supervised. So let's take advantage that we know who is a smoker in the sequencing data that we use, uh, which is, um, I, I, know, I, I don't know if you're familiar, it's called uh, TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. Okay. It's publicly available. And okay, so what we did, you know, standard approach in the sense of having a training set and a test set and have do, you know, different folds. Uh, I think it was five rounds of, uh, you know, three folds cross validation. And, uh, and, and but the main, the main uh, approach was the following. We first, and I'll go through the steps actually, at least one of them in, in some detail. The first one was to decide what were our features, okay? So we call the context matters and you'll see why, but I would say this is feature engineering, the feature engineering step, okay? And then we had the feature selection, all right? And then based on selecting this feature, we were doing prediction, right? And then seeing how it's performing and, and so on. And, and this will give us, you know, this, this gave us the signatures. So let, let, me, let me go over uh, in uh, some detail to this, but let me, before, before doing that, let me just say that if you ask me personally, so this, uh, I, you know, I give you some tips, maybe they're completely worthless, but to, uh, you know, you get, for me, you get what I think is uh, important, and um, and you see it later today again. But I think many people uh, or many focus um, too little on the feature engineering part. In general, this is I, I'm talking now about machine learning. I'm not talking about mutational signatures. Okay, so we know that you have features and we have textbooks talking about the important problem of feature selection, right? So you have many features. How do you pick the ones that you really want? And then we talk about, you know, learning and prediction and, you know, all kinds of metrics to decide how well we are doing and, you know, how to minimize, you know, I saw yesterday square loss and things like that. Okay, that's all cool. But you know what? If what you put in, is not good, no matter how good the method is, it's not going to be very good what comes out, right? So in my opinion, even for people working in machine learning, my recommendation, I hope you remember is, the feature engineering is the key to the whole approach, always, okay? I mean, unless you are doing something that it's already been done a million times and so everyone knows what to do there, okay? But if you are developing, if you are in a relatively new field and you are trying to learn new biology, feature engineering is where I spend 90% of my time, okay? In fact, you will see today that at the end of the day, uh, the methodology was very simple, okay? Okay, so 
how do we do feature engineering here? Well, let me first start uh, describing the tree, this tree here on the left. So we have, um, take any patient, okay? We do sequencing, uh, just standard whole genome, whole exome sequencing uh, using, um, you know, any uh, mutational color you want. Uh, for, for now, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and, and this is bulk sequencing, okay? Now, when we do that, I think you have learned by now, or you probably already knew it way before coming to the school, that you know you come out with a list of somatic or germline mutations, but in this case, it's somatic mutations, all right? So mutations that have accumulated in a patient after birth, specifically in this case, in the cancer of that patient. Okay, so there is a total number of them, right? Whatever the, the, the algorithm gives us at the end of this whole process of sequencing. Now, as we discussed yesterday, we can split, because you always have C combined with G and T with A, we can, when we think about the mutations, the point mutations of the single nucleotide that can occur, there are only six types, okay? So we can think about Cs and Ts, and then you can think in the other way about Gs and As by symmetry. But essentially, it's always a C becoming either an A, a G, or a T, or a T becoming an A, a C, or a G. Okay. Okay. But then, so this is, if you want, the, the first level uh, that gives you some information on the mutation type. But then you can say, well, I want to add some context, right? So maybe it matters what are the flanking bases. So how about for the C2T mutation, right? Uh, that mutation, so when I look at the C, that became a T, I can ask, what is the next nucleotide to the right of it? Well, that can be a G or a T, right? Uh, sorry, uh, G, T, or A. I don't know why here. Oh, yeah, sorry, from here, right? It's an A, a C, a G, okay, or a T. Yeah, so those are the four because there are four leptons, T, C, G, and A. Um, similarly, I can say, well, instead, forget the, the base flanking on the right. What about the one on the left? Well, it can be, again, A, C, G, and T, okay? So this gives me you know, a bit more context about the mutation. And now I can play this game again and say, well, you know, give me, let's consider this C that becomes a T that's followed by an A. Um, what about the letter on the left, right? Well, it can be an A, C, a G, and a T. So now you have the triplets. This is, this, this gives you the 96 types that we saw already yesterday, right? The total. But this methodology is actually flexible. Um, we can go down further. Right? We can ask for two bases on each side or three bases on each side. And, and sometimes it really matters, right? Okay. And so these are, in a sense, this is the space of all potential features. Okay. And then you have to decide which ones uh, you are going to consider. Well, um, what we did here, again, is, is pretty simple. So, for example, let's say a C is changed to something else, right? Uh, and you say, what? let's assume for simplicity here that everything is probable in the same way, which, by the way, it's basically is true. Right? So a T can become an A, G, or a T, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. So we have the C becomes an A, a G, or a T. So then there will be a pro one third probability that this happens, one third that this happens, one third that this happens. This will be the no, right? If this is completely a random phenomenon, this is what you would expect. That if I take a bunch of C2T of, of mutations 
the RHSC changed to something else, I would have a third, a third, and a third. And similarly here, right? <laughs> but so the null is that when you take all the mutations, the total mutation count in that patient, you look at whatever the frequency of C is, okay? And then you say, well, that frequent that you know that product times a third will give me what I expect to be, for example, the C to T mutation. Yeah, this is the null hypothesis. This is under you know under purely random conditions. Okay, so then you can do a simple test. Okay, so just in this case a one-sided binomial test where you say, do I observe this with a frequency that's higher than what would be just suspended by pure chance, okay? And if I do, I select it. These are not still the features that we're going to use to, for the, you know, for the senators. This is just the first step. But then this, this thing is considered important. It goes to the next step, right? Say if instead the C2G is observed exactly how you, as you would expect in, 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 you know, under random, completely random conditions, then it means that if we are looking at, say, smoking, right, then it means the smoking doesn't seem to have anything to say for that particular mutation. Is, is it clear? Ask me if it's not. Okay. Um, all right, so then you can say, um, well, let's play this game again, right? And now, given there is a C2T mutation. Okay, I wonder if my microphone, because sometimes I hear it, sometimes I don't. Let me. Oh, I don't want to be one of those online with the headphones right now. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I repeat this thing one more time. So we are trying to figure out what, uh, say, smoking or any carcinogen, really, uh, or just any factor related to cancer, does in terms of mutations, uh, frequencies, okay? And which types of mutations? So um, from a statistical point of view, one way, right, the normal way to think about it would be, well, let's think about what is expected by pure chess. Okay, and that would be my null hypothesis. And if I see that, then there is nothing special about that particular event, right? But if I see some deviation, you know, relatively large deviation from that, then it means that there is something happening, the smoking is doing, for example, right? Uh, to that particular mutation type. And the simple way to do that is, for example, with the total number of mutations, to look at C2Ts, we say, well, how many C2Ts would you expect? So out of, I say a patient has 150 mutations total, okay? <clears throat> and, uh, and so I have six mutation types. If say they were equally probable, right? I would expect to have what? 25 in each bucket here, in each of these types, right? <clears throat> so I would take the total number of mutation, I will look at the normal frequency, for example, for the C, say Cs are one half of all the mutation, right? Under random, uh, under pure chance. So the normal frequency of C will be one half. Okay, so the base that's going to be mutated is either a C or a T. The proportion of C and Ts in the human genome is about one half and one half. So it's the total, 150 mutation times one half is 75, right? And then, because it can mutate and become an A, a G, or a T, meaning there are three possibilities. If those are equally probable, I take one-third, one-third, and one-third as the probability for those three cases, right? So that says that the expected number of C to T mutations is given by this formula, which is right here in bold. It's the total mutation count time the normal frequency of C is time one-third. And that gives me the null, under the null, 
right? That's the frequency that I start. Okay, so now I can do, I can run a binomial test for the frequency for the number of mutations that I actually observe, the C2T mutation that I observe in a patient, right? For example, if I observe 150 mutations in a patient, but then this patient has 100 C2Ts, and say, look, this is definitely not by chance. There is something special about C2T, right? It should be about 25. And I observe, you know, whatever I said, 100, right? Is that clear? Okay. So, so then I can repeat this again and go to the next level and calculate what is the U respect, again, under pure chance conditions. And then you can run a test to see how far you are from that, right? And now anything that is significantly greater than expected, you keep, you say, okay, I want to keep this guy under observation, okay? Okay, so uh, doing this, basically this, um, we go, what I say, we go uh, down the tree. I think it's clear why, right? Now notice that when we get to the second level, I have to run two tests, okay? So for this mutation C becoming a T followed by an A, I both want to test whether it's significantly different from what would I expect given the number of C2Ts that I have, as well as given the number of total number of mutations. And, and I keep doing this, okay? So if I go down to the third level, I, now I test it going up. You know, tested with the parents and grandparents, okay, all the relevant ones. Okay. And why I do this? Why I go down the tree? Because, so why do I want to test this? Why I don't test just this against the total number of mutations, right? Well, because let's say I already decided the C2T is special. If C2T is special, this may also be much higher than normal just because it's a C2T. There may be nothing special about the fact that it's followed by an A, right? So, I, I, so here what I'm testing is, well, given, say, for example, that there were a lot of C2Ts, so we know C2T is special. Is there something even more special about C2T followed by an A? Or when we control for the fact that it's a special, you know, it's C2T, that already takes into account why I see a lot more followed by an A than, do you see the point? Is that clear? And so I do this. And so we got what I said, we got down the tree. And then, and then we do the opposite, okay? Once we have selected, we test going up the tree. Because what could happen, so, here we are testing whether this guy is special given that we already know that the parent of this guy was special, right? And so, and we do that process. But once we have reached the bottom, whatever the bottom is, now we want to ask, actually, was that parent really special or was it just because of the child of that parent that that parent seemed to be special? You see what I mean? So was it this guy really the special one that brought a lot of mutations in or was the child that did that? And so the parent looked good just because it was the child doing all the work for, for that parent, you see? So then you need to go up the tree and, and do that, pass in that direction, okay? So this is how we selected the features. Okay, and then um, maybe let me just... You know, and then and then the rest was actually very simple because then all we did is we ranked the features based on AUC. Okay, where what we were using was predicting, depending on what you know, small key and age and so on. Uh, we were looking at AUC as the metric. Okay, so then we ranked the features, and and that allows us, allow us to select. Uh, our feature that actually were used, you know, doing this training, the feature that were used to then do the, the final prediction, okay? And the selected ones uh, then 
where once once you have them, then you have you can build the probability distribution. You can build the signatures, right? Once you know which ones are the key features, now you look just at them and see what is the probability of those features. Okay, so uh, because uh, notice one one key difference of this approach to the previous one is that in the previous one, all ninety six the distribution is all over ninety six types. Okay, here we chose we we thought there is so much noise in this data that we think it's kind of nonsense to try to give a value to all 96 types in a signature. We think the signature is probably one peak or two, you know, in general or often. So let's focus on the key features. They are really bringing the signal, okay? And the rest, forget about it because it's just adding noise and making things worse, not better. So I'll show you some examples of what uh, we ended up with. So for example, on the left side, these are all signatures for age. So as you can see, even in general, uh, it's you know few peaks, even just one in breast cancer. Okay. Um, but but always few peaks. I mean, even in that case, which is the one where we have more features, you know, we are talking about seven of them. By the way, the number of features selected at the end was done, you know, in, in training, right? You come up with the optimal N. Um, but just by looking at prediction of, in terms of how they were performing. So anyway, so that's uh, this for age. And now what is interesting about this is, as you can see, in the previous work, there is a signature for age. But what I'm showing you here is the different tissues have different signatures. Okay, so tissues like to make different mistakes normally under regular conditions, just aging. Okay, and even when we look at other factors. Okay, so first of all, here you see like there are um, uh, you know this is a signature for alcohol in a tissue and. BRCA and so on. But look at smoking. So this is the smoking signature in lung. It's all green because it's all C to A's type of mutations. So C is the become A. By the way, we knew that like uh, smoking likes to make C to A's uh, become A. And then, you know, for head and neck, very different, right? I would say bladder and head and neck are much similar to each other than in lung. Okay. So, um, and then you can use you can use the signature to, as you were asking, to assess how much of each one of the signatures is present in a patient. Okay, and there we once you have the signatures, if you think about those, you know, the the matrix of signatures, then you basically can do non-negative linear regression. Okay, and that spits out your prediction. So. Doing that, we estimated, and this is a completely different methodology from what I showed you yesterday. We came out with almost a very similar answer to what we had yesterday, which is about 70% of all the mutations that are found across cancer patients of all cancer types are attributable to basically just R, to the aging component, okay? So that's cool because now we can look at a patient and say to a, in a given patient, here is what I see for you, right? Um, and of course, as I was saying before, um, well, let me, uh, okay, how many, do we have any, how many in this room are interested in biology? Because I, I spend a lot of time talking about biology and maybe I'm, I'm killing the others. Okay, so maybe just for you and, and maybe some of those online, let me just mention here, one very interesting thing that came up out of this work is that when we look at the, at the senators and how close they are to each other, okay? And you can think about cosine similarity among the vectors and things like that. What we discovered is there were exceptions, for example, smoking in lung cancer as a very specific senator, okay? But there the smoke is right next to the tissue, okay? But in general, um, 
even smoking, when you look at tissues that are not in direct contact with the exposure, what happens is, uh, in general, um, the effect of the environmental factor has a similar signature to what the R factor, the aging signature of that tissue has normally. So basically transla translating that in, in, you know, in simple words, often a, car a carcinogen, uh, the suggestion is that the carcinogen then is just inducing inflammation and cell death. So it will kill the cell. Now a new cell needs to be produced. And in that cell division, the mistakes made accumulate, you know, the mutation accumulated look like that tissue always does. The same type of signature, just the signature in that tissue for aging of that tissue, okay? So there is nothing too special often. It's just that the environmental factor causes uh, the cell death and, and therefore more of those mutations, okay? So there is some, um, uh, lots of similarities with the tissue of origin. That's why we think it's, ex it's fundamental when you look at mutation signatures to think about it in terms of tissue specific signatures. And finally, we found the mutation signature for obesity, okay? Which is, was very important at the time because uh, people think still today in many ways, the obesity has nothing to do with DNA. Okay, and instead, in some tissues, we could predict an obese person just based on the DNA, all right? And so that's, uh, now someone may say, okay, who cares that you can predict an obese person from the senator of DNA? I just put that person on the scale. I can tell you that right away. I may not even need to put on the scale, okay? But, okay, that's fine, and 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 maybe true, but think now about many other factors, even very simple factors like smoking, right? If I call a patient and I say, are you a smoker? Okay, if that patient is honest, we'll say yes, right? But now I start asking, how many packs per day? You know, how many cigarettes? Okay, it already gets very sketchy, right? Because now this person has to remember over the years, right? And you try to so here, what you have is something that ideally, when it's working properly, it's actually looking at what the smoking cause in terms of being recorded on the DNA, right? So I have a quantification of the effect of smoking rather than a memory of how much I smoked, you know? Some of us smoked a lot and may be lucky and the DNA was not damaged that much, right? So even for factors that we know a person has been exposed, it's still actually quite important if we can look at what happened to the DNA of that patient. Okay? Yes. Oh, yes, the microphone. Yeah. It, oh, it's, I thought it was good. Okay. Uh, I did not quite understand how you uh, associate each of the signatures with an etiology. Like, do you, uh, when you begin, divide your, like, the subjects into smokers and non-smokers and then do the tests? Perfect, yes. Yes, uh, yeah, that's very important. Sorry, I, I skipped to say that because, you know, by saying that these are super, it's a supervised methodology, that's basically what it means, right? That I'm teaching, I'm training the algorithm by creating labels. And so if I want a smoking signature, I'm going to have a set of smokers, a set of non-smokers, and I learn what is different. So that's how that's how we did. Oh, you have another question. Okay, uh, it's related. So, yeah. um, uh, two questions. I'm wondering how the same was done in the unsupervised way uh, in the in what was initially the case, and if using the supervised case, you could um, like overcome the pitfall of like all patients having a smoking signature. Is that Perfect, great question. And I'll, I'll show you now, I think I have a slide to answer the question. So the first one is, so here you have a comparison of the performance in terms of AUC of the supervised methodology versus the unsupervised, okay? And uh, where as expected, right, the supervised methodology uh, should do better than the unsupervised one, okay? And, and so, and for the other question, yes, we, um, uh, because we 
thanks to this feature engineering approach, we drastically reduced the space of the features to only a few peaks, sometimes even just one or two. We essentially eliminated the problem of finding every signature in every patient with some you know, different quantities, but as, as I showed you. So yes, that, that was one, you know, that was the key for achieving that. And let me say one more thing, and then I think I, I really, okay, this, this is a package, and if anyone is interested, it's very easy to use, and the data is there, so you, you can play with that. Uh, I, I, recommend, I highly recommend it, of course. But let me just say one thing uh, to, you know, <clears throat> there is only one limitation of the supervised approach. So if I had to be, you know, if I had to play the devil's advocate, I would say, okay, this is very cool, but you know what? Um, well, okay, if I'm not very good as of, an ad, of a lawyer, I would say, well, what about, you know, annotation is often not very good. And so things are mislabeled and all of that. Okay, to that, I just say, look, moving forward, right? Data quality will become better and better. Technology is going to become better and better. I, I don't think that's not the reason to go in the supervised way. I think actually so, so the supervised approach should just improve even further with better quality of data. But I think the most serious criticism is the following. What if you don't have a training set, right? So as you were asking, to train this methodology, I need to have a set of smokers and a set of non-smokers. But what if I don't? What if I, what if I don't know? Uh, I may not even know what this posture is, right? The unsupervised approach has the advantage that in theory, it gives you something. You may not know what it is, but you get something, okay? Um, and, and, and actually, I agree with that. That is a limitation of any supervised approach. To do supervision, you have to have labels. But my, what we show in this paper, and I don't have time here to show you, but let me just mention it so that if you're interested, you can look at it, is even in that case, what we show in this paper is you are better off by first removing, so first learning the supervised part. Okay, say for example, I, I have a set of patients. Well, assign how much of the patients, you know, how much aging had an effect, how much smoking had an effect, okay? And so on, and remove those effects that for which we had supervision that we were able to learn with labels, okay? Take those out of the total load of mutations. Now on the leftover, do the unsupervised approach and see if you see anything else, okay? So we propose this basically, you know, a mixture of two methodologies. I don't remember if we call the semi-supervised, right? Which basically allows you to take care of, uh, by the way, when I say uh, the label, we can, we can apply it to, uh, with the supervised method, we can apply to a patient for which we don't know anything, right? But now a new patient comes in and we have signatures for, say, smoking, alcohol, and obesity, to say. We have more, like I think 50, total, but, but let's say we have those three, right? So let's evaluate those three, see how much they count out of the total found in that patient. And then if we want to see about anything else possibly there, take those out and now apply the unsupervised approach to the leftover. And we show that when you do that on the unsupervised part, you get a lot clearer signal, okay? What we did is we pretend that we didn't know about one of the, one of the carcinogens for which we have labels. And we say, okay, let's pretend we didn't know, right? And let's just go with NMF and, and try to find the peak versus Let's first take age and smoking out and now see if we can find this, I don't know, remember what it was, if it was uh, sunlight or something, okay? And indeed, once you remove age and, and you know, the, the, the leftover becomes a lot cleaner. Okay. And sorry, I know that this, you know, in a sense, this may require a lot more slides to go through all the details of it, but I just wanted to, to show you some, uh, you know, several examples of, okay, so actually, we're even later today <laughs> of what I thought. Um, so let me try to go 
faster. May yeah, oh, please, please. Question from the live chat question. Yes. Uh, uh, one idea uh, bring to my mind, I want to uh, share with you. After you uh, factorize this matrix, you have the signature. How would we, if we uh, treat this signature as a random variable and try to build a joint distribution based on data? So for example, Bayesian network, and then uh, we have enough data to learn this dependency between the uh, between different signatures. So maybe uh, at least I'm sure it is not the good assumption that one signature related to one cancer. So we can find the uh, different signatures. And when we have a new patient, we can use that model to uh, yeah, predict and the probability would, would be the better than the zero and one. So we get rid of this uh, hard feature Binary, engineering yeah. and all terrain. Yeah, yeah. So um, we we thought about. I'll, I'll leave it out. So we thought about the the dependency and uh, and we left it to future work. And but uh, my answer is uh, certainly yes. It's a it's a very good uh, thing to do because you know I think everyone understood. The signatures, there are dependencies among them, right? Or we expect them to, to be related to each other in some ways. So instead of treating them, uh, well, I guess NMF in some way, if, if we're talking about the NMF approach, right? In some way, it's considering everything together and, and then breaking down different parts. Um, but I think an approach where you start from the beginning, right? It's a more mathematical way to ass assume a random variable where you learn the joint distribution, then you can learn the dependencies among these uh, effects in a, in a more proper way. So yes, definitely a, a very good idea and work that has not been done yet, so. Okay, uh, I'll talk about, um, I'll switch now. Uh, uh, tomorrow we'll do, uh, in a sense, maybe, you know, from a practical point of view, the most, uh, yeah, uh, from a patient point of view, maybe the most important thing right now to work on, in my opinion. But uh, at the base, uh, you always have to have a model to understand how cancer occurs. And so I'll show you here some work that we have done. Um, and, uh, and maybe let me, I think, let me see. I, I, uh, okay. Let me let me just. Uh, I'll try to be quick. <laughs> so, um, and again, don't worry too much. My suggestion is don't worry too much about the details. This is really to give you some mental pictures and some ideas of what you can do. Okay, with with the various tools that I'm showing. So, <clears throat> uh, modeling cancer or tumor evolution means. Understanding how you go from a healthy tissue to cancer, okay? And in fact, even from when you are developing a healthy tissue to, to cancer. And um, one thing that was never done really, and that's why we call it multi-phase, is that often modelers focus on you have the first cancer cell and you are modeling the explosion of this you know, this cancer growing and becoming detected and maybe metastasized. Um, but the question is, what about the, the phase before, which is, you have, you know, the healthy tissue that's accumulating this dangerous mutations all the way to cancer. And in fact, even, even, even before birth, as I said, okay. And so, um, and then you want to do this not just for one cell, of course, but you want to do it for an organ, so for a set of cells. And, uh, and so initially, we started with this paper in 2020 in PNS with Kamel. We looked at the simplest, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, the simplest way to do this was with simulations because it was too complicated at that time to, to do it with formulas. At least, uh, well, uh, it wasn't too complicated, but 
it was a work that we started in parallel and was taking longer actually Sophie here is I'll show you in a second what we did in terms of analytical formulas but you know simulation it's faster to to deal with so we wanted to get some results and some intuitions so what we assume is you have a cell that it's you know alive and it a cell can die, of course, with some rate or divide. And if a cell divides, we assume three types of division. I'll show you in a second what those are. And then, and then different type of mutations, which I'll show you in a second what those <laughs> are, okay? And now we want to do this for every cell on an organ. And we're talking, say, about million, billion, uh, billions of cells and across the lifetime of a person. And so uh, just to show you, I talked about different types of division. Um, stem cells, you can think about stem cells as the cells that are the engine of a tissue. Okay, they can they are the only cells that can make a copy of themselves. Okay. All the other cells, when they divide, the daughter cells are more differentiated, basically are getting closer and closer to the final function that the cell has to provide. All right. Uh, the stem cells have the potential to, uh, they are multipotent, you know, they, they can become in a sense, anything they want. Um, so when you, and, and they are very long lived. In fact, because they can make a copy of themselves, their progeny, their lineage is always alive in us, right? In general, and uh, unless they die. Uh, instead for the differentiated cells, um, they are short lived, they provide the function and then they are gone. So we focus on stem cells and um, here we are showing uh, different events. The first one is, so with some uh, division rate B, birth rate, right? Cells are born. And uh, with probability P, these divisions produce like a stem cell and a more differentiated one or progenitor. Okay, so we call this asymmetric division because the two daughters are not the same. And then, so one minus P, we obtain uh, this other type of division where the two dollars are both stem cells, okay? And we call this symmetric cell free neuron. And then you have the possibility of a stem cell to produce two differentiated cells. And this actually, it's equivalent to a death for a stem cell because the, you know, a stem cell is replaced by two cells that are neither stem cells. And then the last case, of course, is that, okay? So this is what the cells can do. And then cells can, and then mutations can occur. And we, I, I know, you know, you know about driver mutations. These are the bad guys. And what we did for the first time in this paper is that usually in mathematical modeling, you just assume that there is a, a bad mutation and there is some probability of being hit by a bad mutation. Yeah. But we kind of wanted to do a little bit better than that and said, well, you know, the mutations can be of all kinds. But there is some consensus. There are three major classes of bad mutations, okay? And here is the class, and it's very easy to, to cast in mathematical terms. There is one class, which is called cell survival, which is increasing the speed of cell division, okay? So you hit one of these ones, and cells start dividing faster, okay? So the rate of division B goes up, or death, the death rate goes down. Okay, so this is a class that we call cell survival or CS mutations. And then is that there are, there are um, uh, other type of mutations that belong to this group which is called cell fate. And so what that does, when referring back to the figure I just showed you, does increase the probability of this happening versus that, okay? So as you can imagine, you want to maintain things in balance and stem cells, as I told you, are the engine of a tissue. You want for this event to happen in general, only when there is a death, right? So think about the group of stem cells. If I want to keep things in equilibrium, I stay like that until when one of us, one of the stem cells dies. At that point, you want one stem cell to create two daughter stem cells. So you want that. But only when you have a death event, you want one of this, right? In equilibrium. So now imagine that something like a driver mutation increases, sorry, uh, decreases P, probability P. So basically increases this event 
from what is normal. Now you start having a uncontrolled growth, right? So this is not about frequency of division. You know, say for example, instead of dividing every month, now it's dividing every 20 days. There's nothing to do with that. This is about what the division produces, okay? That's why it's called self faith So that's uh, the second class. And the final class, uh, the GM type of mutation, genome maintenance, are uh, mutations that hit the repair mechanism genes, basically. So these are mutations that cause um, a lot, so they cause uh, the duplication of DNA to go wrong more easily, okay? Or to be repaired, uh, not as well, okay? So you can put driver mutations in one of these three buckets, basically. And we want to take into account that effect, okay? And also we wanted to take into account that there is a killing capacity. So you will be shocked about how much of the mathematical modeling field, modeling tumor evolution, assume exponential growth, okay? Which is completely ridiculous, right? Um, but, you know, in math, the exponential function, it's easy to deal with, to do integration, and right? But, uh, okay, so you understand that obviously that's not the case. That cannot be the case. So now, you know, again, I did it too. But if you're modeling a cancer that's exploding, that may be okay. You know, if you say, well, I'm modeling as an exponential growth just because I care all the way to when it becomes so big that the patient, you know, that the cancer is detected, so it's going to be fine. But if you're detect, if you're modeling, for example, a, um, a growth that is pre-cancer, okay, then there definitely it's not realistic, right? So it depends on, it always depends on what you are trying to do. Okay, so let me skip this because we don't have time. Let me just say that with that model, which uh, I, I don't discuss here, I'll, but I'll give you math details now of it, of it of an analytical uh, model that does the same thing, we were able to um, reproduce the cancer incidence of, of different cancer types. So uh, what we did is with this simulation, so we simulated, right, each cell, billions of cells in an organ of an individual, and then we simulated, say, 10,000 individuals and just went through life with them and see how much cancer we would get. And we did that for common, and we fit the data, okay? And the fit is, by the way, you know, not fantastic, I would say, because I actually didn't care for the fitting to be perfect. That was not the point, okay? As you all know, it's easy to fit stuff, okay? So there's nothing too impressive in fitting an incidence curve with a mathematical model. But what was important is that what we wanted to see is, let's say now we change only two, three parameters. And instead of modeling colon, now we want to model, say, pancreas, okay? So what this means is in pancreas, what we changed was, uh, uh, well, I'll give you some sense of what we changed. For example, we changed the total number of cells, okay? Pancreas has a different number of cells than colon, stem cells. And then we change how often the cells divide. In colon, the colon divides every four days. It's completely re renewed when you're young, okay? Uh, in pancreas, if I remember correctly, it's in the order of every eight months to a year, okay? So much slower. Um, and also uh, in colon, because of this crazy amount of division, it's almost always asymmetric division. So P is huge in colon, okay? In pancreas, because pancreas does not divide that much, actually pretty often it's because of a, cell, of a stem cell dying, okay? So P is not as high. In pancreas, uh, uh, I think it's 0 0.5, 0 0.6 versus in colon, it's like 90, I don't know, 98, 95, 98%. Okay, so, so what was impressive, in my opinion, of this, uh, of this work was that when we did that, we were able to reproduce the cancer incidence, pancreatic cancer incidence. And then we did it again with leukemia, and again, we were able to feed it. 
And then we did it with Lynch syndrome, which these are colorectal cancer patients, which have a mutation rate that's 10 times higher than normal. And we were able to you know, qualitatively fit their instance. So what that means is that the model is capturing some basic ingredients that are you know, good enough to give you at least a ballpark uh, you know, uh, incidence curve. I mean, an incidence curve that's pretty close qualitatively to the real one. Um, so then, uh, and, and and the other thing, here I'm giving you some sense of what the model did, and then I'll show you some of the math behind this type of models. But the other thing that was, in my opinion, striking uh, that we presented in that model is the following. In general, in previous work, when you look at the events that take a person to cancer, uh, they are presented as, and this is a technical term in the field, accelerating waves. Actually, you are a physicist, physicist, so you can understand this obviously very well, right? So, and it's intuitive. I get hit by a driver mutation, now I start having a colon expansion that should not be there. So there's this uncontrolled growth. And then within that subpopulation, that clone, I'm hit by a second driver mutation. Now this cells grow even faster, right? Because of the second accelerator. And so if you consider the slope of this, you know, the, the line here of this cone as the speed, right? The speed is increasing, it's getting faster and faster. And so in, I would say, essentially all the previous work, if you asked when these events occur, you would say, well, if here is time of cancer, a lot of them occur, you know, pretty recently, okay? Because of, but you know what? This was a, a result of assuming exponential growth. You know, if you assume exponential growth, you keep increasing the lambda, you're going to explode in terms of growth, right? Once you have a carrying capacity, what we found is actually that you could even have situations where the first mutation, you know, so say before it was thought that the whole process took maybe 10 years, of which the last two events occurred in the last two, three years before the patient was diagnosed with cancer. What we found is that is that in, in many cases, we estimated that the first of the three mutations that took a person to colorectal cancer happened when this person was 15 year old. And the second, 20 years later or so. Okay, so a, a much more flat distribution, no accelerating way. wave, right? Okay. Um, so here, here is another example of improving the assumptions of the model, how you get a completely different result, right? And really different. Okay, and, and this, by the way, this was motivated by, and that's why we did it in terms of simulations at the beginning, because it was complicated. And we wanted just to say, well, okay, let's just put in to the model, the ingredients that we know are important, you know, that are necessary. And let's see what we observe, right? Rather than say, I know how to solve this particular equation, let me just use it and, and, and we go with that. Okay, so what we did is, I'll, I'll skip this one since we're like, what we did is we then, uh, of course, decided to, um, to do it mathematically because no mathematician likes simulations really, okay? If you have to, you have to, but if you can avoid it, that's great. So, okay, let me um, show you again the, the basic here is, right? We have a, um, we have time. This actually was just published uh, about two weeks ago. So consider driver mutations hitting in, in time, right? Hitting um, the organ of a person. And, and let's say that you need, in this case, I'll, I'll use three driver mutations as the number of events that you need to get to cancer, okay? And so you have these times at which the mutations have occurred and they have survived 
an initial growth that's very stochastic and may end up with extinction. Okay, so T1, T2, T3. And let's assume that we need three of them for simplicity. And as you now know, let's assume that the cells can, you know, the, the four events we can have in for the cells are these four, they are already described. So symmetric, you know, self-renewal, asymmetric division, differentiation, and that. And, and here is, here is a, a very important part of, of the whole model, which is assume a carrying capacity C, okay? And now we, we didn't want to lose the stochastic, stochastic part of the model, which is important especially at the beginning of a clone, right? When you have few cells. So initially we model, you know, the process like a, a branching process, birth and death process, which could go to a sting. So the, you have a cell hit by a dry mutation, which gives some proliferation advantage, some fitness advantage. And now this can cause a growth and the growth can then, you know, decline and the clone can go to extinction or survive, okay? And we assume for simplicity that there is a survival size. Basically, once you reach a certain population size, the probability of going to extinction, it's, it's almost zero, okay? So from that point on, actually, that was part of the trick. The point on, you can model a deterministic, like a standard differential equation, right? And there, so we use standard logistic growth, assuming a, a given current capacity, okay? And this threshold, for the survival was the kind of capacity times some small epsilon. Yes. If you if you have a question, yeah. Yes. Uh, does the carrying capacity need to be the same for all clones? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, so first of all, carrying capacity is de depends on or can depend on a tissue, right? Different tissues may have different capa carrying capacities, but also for a particular um, cancer type, the carrying capacity can be affected by the drivers, okay? So it can be actually function. Now I'm showing here a simplified version of the model because you know if I had to show the model, we would have to stay probably you know, a good five, six hours, I would say you know, of which the first 30 minutes is just definitions to make really sure that we are putting it down right. Um, okay, so, but all the details are in the paper, by the way. And uh, Sophie is the first author and Omarie Lambert, um, I'll show you again how, how it's written. So where is the, yeah, here is, oh, no. I thought we had the, yeah. So as it's written there, Sophie Penison, who is in the room, and Amarie Lambert, who is um, a you know, uh, very well-known uh, probabilist uh, applied mathematician in, uh, in Paris. Um, yeah, in Paris. I think Paris is it or no? Where is, where is Amarie? I, I'm, I, College de France. Normal, also, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, so... Okay, and then as I already discussed, we wanted to include the effect of the different types of fitness. Okay, so self survival, based on based on the you know the letters here, self survival increases the proliferation rate, right? So dB delta B, it's positive, so B increases. Self fate increases, uh, sorry, decreases P, right? So dP is negative. Genome maintenance increases the probability of a mutation. So it's delta U, it's positive, okay? All right. So given that, we get this. Let me see, how much time do we have? I'm trying to decide if, yeah, I think we can. Um, maybe let me just show the first slide here and then we'll start tomorrow. We're actually not too far from the end, so I, I think tomorrow we can finish. Um, so let's go slowly now, because if I go fast, I just get you lost and then it's completely useless. And um, I, 
we try to have here really just the kind of big picture formulas that I think it's actually pretty easy to understand once you think about it. Okay, so we are interested in understanding time to cancer, right? And uh, we are modeling um, from conception. Okay, so this is even before birth. Um, and okay, well, let's start from here. First, we are starting with n number of required driver mutations. So I told you before, typically we pick n to be three. You know, three major events need to occur, but of course, that number is variable. Usually it's between one and four. And when is the cancer occurs? Cancer occurs when one of these surviving clones. Now, why do I say surviving? Because if you remember in the previous figure, the first thing has to happen for the clone to get to cancer is it has to reach the size epsilon C. If you don't reach it, you're going to invest into extinction, okay? So first you have to survive. That's why we talk about surviving clones. Um, so the surviving clone has to have the form, you know, V1 to Vn, where N is the number of drivers. So let's say if it's three, right? We have V1, V2, V3, where V is just belonging to one of the three types of driver mutation I told you, okay? So the mutations are either increasing cell survival, the CS mutations in the previous slides, or increasing, you know, cell fate switching to, to our more self-renewal or genome maintenance, increasing the production of mutations. So V belongs to one of this. And to get to cancer, right? If you need three of those, that you can think about all the possible combinations that can heal the cancer. And here, by the way, you can put conditions on which ones, right? For example, um, in, in our case, we said you need three for colon, you need three and you have to have at least one S and one F, okay? Why? Maybe because we know from data that that is a typical situation, okay? Or you may not force it. You may want to see, um, um, you know, what happens. For example, in the simulation model, I forgot to say, that was very cool. One thing that happened is in column, um, Yeah, actually, sorry, let me go back because that's that's an important thing. Um, so in colon, do I have APC here? Yes, okay. So in colon, when you look at the driver mutations, Actually, the, I showed you some paper. I don't know if you read Bear Vogestein as a co-author with me. You know, Bear Vogestein, if you are in cancer biology, I mean, he's probably one of the top three in the world cancer researchers. Uh, he's the one that discovered the C. He is the one that discovered, I would say, that cancer occurs as an accumulation of driver mutations, okay? And, and he made fundamental discoveries for APC and TP53, okay? Um, in textbooks, they have the Vogel gram, which is basically a fancy word to say the Vogelstein figure that shows how you go from healthy tissue to colorectal cancer, okay? And the standard way it happens doesn't have to be always like that, but the most typical is that you get first hit by an APC mutation, okay? Which is a cell fate mutation. And then you get hit by a KRAS mutation which is a cell survival mutation, okay? Uh, guess what? We simulated, I told you about the simulations, we simulated collector cancer. We didn't keep track of the sub, you know, the, sub, uh, the different types of mutations within a group. We just kept track of the class. And in fact, in colon, when we look at colorectal cancer patients in our simulations, and we ask what was the first mutation, okay? The first mutations were cell fate. I told you that we did pancreas. When we looked at pancreatic cancer patients, in pancreas, one thing that's kind of surprising is that in pancreas, 
the first mutation is actually always KRAS, or uh, very often is KRAS, right? So you may ask, why, why, right? I mean, this, they are cancer, okay, in two different tissues, but why this would be like that? And we provided at least a, a piece of the explanation, which is that, now think about it, you're a physicist, right? So this is very, I, I think physicists are the best, you know, better mathematicians that uh, definitely are thinking about modeling and models, uh, because that's a lot of what you do. So think you have a tissue like colon where, well, let me start with pancreas. Think we have a tissue like pancreas where you divide every once a year, okay? Well, guess what? Either I increase the heck out of that division rate or I'm not going to get to cancer if I need to get three driver mutations to get to cancer, okay? So requirement number one for a tissue that's dividing very slowly is that you speed up division rate. I don't care what division, just give me more divisions, right? Well, that's the green group here. So survival. And in fact, that's exactly when we look at pancreatic cancer in the simulations, it wouldn't happen starting with that group. It had to be this, okay? You need to bring it down to divisions every few weeks or you're not going to, the probability of getting, of getting these drug mutations is so small, you're not going to get to cancer in your lifetime in pancreas. But guess what? Colon actually has plenty of division. Okay, the problem for colon is that in colon, it's almost essentially always the division is this one. Um, is this one. Why? Because the stem cell, colon is organized in crypts, and at the base of the crypt, there, is the, there are the stem cells. And the stem cell push up the differentiated cells that provide, you know, the function of the, you know, the lining of the colon. Um, and just to give you this. A terrible picture of it, but you know, here this is the lining of the column. So here is where the food goes through. Well, not really the food, but you know what I mean. Uh, okay, so here is the lining. Here are the differentiated cells. At the base here are the stem cells. Okay, and every time they they do the division with the green cell, they push a green cell up. Okay, and the next time and other green cells, so this one goes up, and they push each other all the way here, and then they die, are done, because being exposed to the acid that's there every four days, as I said, it's, they are replaced. So plenty of division of this type, almost, almost always, almost exclusively, it's this one, okay? Well, for cancer, all right, if I have a lot of division, then I don't care so much about a green, you know, the, the cell survival type of mutation, the most important is give me this. This is really going to make a difference, okay? So basically tissues with different dynamics need to be hit in different ways together, okay? All right, you know what? I, I'm realizing that it's time, so I, I, won't, I won't go over and I'll, uh, uh, we'll just, uh, I think I have uh, a little bit more, so uh, we'll continue tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Do we have any? I think they, I, I like this class because they asked me questions during the, the lecture. Right. At right. The That's certainly a pro. And the, the day has been long and tough for sure. So maybe I will, uh, sure. we can conclude with a very uh, naive question from my side. The, the model that you showed last, uh, does it have any resemblance or connection with the, uh, with the compartment models for pandemic evolution, like the SIR uh, model? Is there a relationship between them? Yes, so the answer is, you know, I, when you said that I remember this textbook, which I have in, in my shelf, uh, which was one of my first textbooks on, on this material, and, you know, this birth and death, these stochastic processes um, uh, are at the base or uh, both epidemiological models like the one you just mentioned, as well as branching processes, which is for the survival phase of the model that I showed until when you get to this epsilon C. 
essentially you are using the same type of you know very similar modeling yes yeah that is so a, the answer is yes that is a very good thing because i think the cross fertilization between the two fields might be helpful in uh, right. in uh, making use of models that have been developed on one side and then you can use it in a different context right i guess okay so thank you very much again and congratulations thank you Thank you.